Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency Coalition's book launch event for Oliver Bullis, Butler to the World, How Britain Helps the World's Worst People Launder Money, Commit Crimes, and Get Away with Anything. I'm Ian Gary, Executive Director of the FACT Coalition. We are pleased to have Oliver join us to talk about his compelling new expose and why it matters not only to the UK, but also to the US and many other countries. As Oliver argues, while the world of offshore finance and illicit financial flows is transnational by nature, the UK stands out for its embrace of dirty money. From his book, Oliver says, financial skullduggery isn't just something that happens in the UK. There's been a concerted and decades long effort to encourage it to do so. However bad countries are, Britain has for decades been worse. It operates as a gigantic loophole, undercutting other countries' rules, massaging down tax rates, neutering regulations, and laundering foreign criminals' money. You can hardly hope for better timing for the launch of this book. Earlier this year in the UK and this month in the US, with last year's Pandora Papers stories and Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, there's unprecedented attention being paid to how Western economies including in the UK and US, provide a safe financial haven for kleptocrats, oligarchs, and criminals. Thankfully, there is also growing momentum for reform. In the US, ranked the world's biggest supplier of financial secrecy by the Tax Justice Network's Financial Secrecy Index, the Treasury Department is implementing reforms to deal with anonymous shell companies and money laundering through real estate. Congress is contemplating new legislation to tackle the so-called enablers who assist kleptocrats and criminals to hide their ill-gotten gains. And we are seeing important new bipartisan efforts, such as the Congressional Caucus Against Foreign Corruption and Kleptocracy, which is driving a range of legislative and policy action, especially during this month, Klepto Month. In the UK, strengthened economic crime legislation is being considered, and last month, an economic crime manifesto was launched with cross-party support. It will be vitally important that the UK and US meet this moment head on and deliver reforms quickly. For example, the US should deliver final rules for implementing the Corporate Transparency Act, setting up our beneficial ownership database by the end of this year. After hearing from Oliver, we will hear more about these efforts from legislators in the US and UK, as well as from advocates on both sides of the Atlantic. For too long, dirty money has driven a race to the bottom to see which jurisdictions could offer the most attractive financial secrecy package. At the same time, investigations and reforms in one jurisdiction, such as the US, have impacts far beyond our borders. As Oliver notes in his book, it was an inquiry by the late Senator Carl Levin that, quote, exposed how the Cayman Islands were responsible for laundering vast amounts of money from the U.S. and forced the island's administration to step in to stop it. It was American congressmen and women who pushed the Cayman Islands out of the shadow banking business. Let's hope that 2022 will mark a historical turning point in the U.S.-U.K special relationship, which will include some friendly competition to rid dirty money from our financial systems. Now I'm very pleased to invite Oliver to present some highlights from his investigations and to discuss whether he's optimistic that reform efforts will be successful. After Oliver, we'll hear from Representative Abigail Spanberger, a member of the Counter Kleptocracy Caucus, and UK MP Kevin Hollenrake, co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on fair business banking. Finally, we'll hear from anti-corruption activists from the US and UK. It's important to note we'll have time for questions, so please get them ready and use the Zoom function to submit them. Now over to you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm a huge admirer of the FACT Coalition's work. I think the FACT Coalition has done probably more than anyone to, to keep the issues of um, tackling corruption via transparency at the forefront of the debate in the US and, and really good to be here. Um, it's been a uh, three months now since my book Butler to the World was out in the UK 
And obviously it's been a big three months for anyone interested in kleptocracy. There's this slightly apocryphal quote from Lenin that there are decades when nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. And it feels a little bit like that at the moment, having gone from um, a January when a UK government minister resigned because of the lack of action to tackle financial crime, to having had an economic crime act and another economic crime bill on the way, it really feels like, you know, there's been a, a dramatic change. Um, and this change has been, you know, all encompassing, thanks to Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there has been a complete reevaluation of the wisdom uh, of having accepted such large amount amounts of Russian origin money into the British economy, uh, having allowed so many major Russian companies and wealthy Russian individuals to have such a big presence in the markets of the City of London. Um, uh, it should have been, frankly, patently obvious that it was unwise a long time ago, but it's finally good that we finally got there in the end. Um, there have been many announcements by the government, obviously many announcements of sanctions, um, and various more or less gimmicky announcements of reforms, some of them, frankly, rather absurd, some of them possibly more hopeful, including the creation of K-Cell, um, kleptocracy cell, a unit within the National Crime Agency, which is briefed as Britain's answer to the FBI, though I'll come on to whether it actually is or isn't in a bit. But <coughs> K-Cell, this, this new effort to tackle kleptocracy, was launched um, to some fanfare earlier this year. And, and I found myself invited into the National Crime Agency to give them a briefing on how Russian kleptocracy works. Obviously this was great and I was very happy to help, but it did feel a little bit alarming. Um, if <coughs> essentially at the beginning of a kind of economic war uh, between our law enforcement agencies and the Russian oligarchs, um, the uh, specialists in tackling this war are only at the stage of asking journalists for a few thoughts, then clearly they haven't done very much preliminary work. I, I was hoping normally by that stage, you would hope the journalists would be asking the professionals for briefings rather than the other way around. A second slightly alarming uh, anecdote is the fact that <laughs> along with a group of activists from a group called the uh, Led by Donkeys, um, I produced a, a video on how money laundering works in London just to try and explain to people why it was so important that urgent action was taken to tackle money laundering. Um, it, it, you know, did quite well on Twitter. And um, I was speaking to a, a friend of mine, a contact in law enforcement a couple of weeks later, who said that he'd been so frustrated trying to get any cooperation from the chief constable of a regional uh, local police force, that he actually sent him a copy of the video and said, here, watch this and understand what money laundering is. Uh, the chief constable emailed him back saying, wow, that's amazing. Is it really as bad as that? So now he's using this video as an educational aid to try and instruct uh, local police uh, chiefs about the importance of doing something about money laundering. Again, it's good that people are taking an interest, but it's also alarming that, you know, short 10 minute videos made for sort of viral use on the internet are being used to educate our police officers here in 2022, when frankly, we should have been aware of the danger of Russian money to the integrity of our economy and democracy a long, long time ago. <coughs> now, Britain, um, you may be wondering why you should care about what's happening in Britain, um, but Britain is at the centre of the global criminal economy. The failure of Britain to enforce uh, the rules around money laundering to allow large quantities, huge quantities of criminal money to flow through the City of London, the National Crime Agency's estimate, which is clearly a guess, is 100 billion pounds a year. That's probably what 130 billion US dollars flowing through the city every year. And um, the fact that that's a one with eight zeros after it is a clear sign that it's just, an, just, a, just a guess, but still it's an indication of the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, the fact that this money is able to flow through the city of London is um, harmful to everywhere else. Everywhere else is affected by transnational organized crime, whether that is kleptocracy in places like Russia or uh, the drug cartels in South America and elsewhere, or terrorism in um, sub-Saharan Africa or, or, or Central Asia or elsewhere. This is clearly a global problem, and the fact that Britain is not doing more to tackle it is a threat to people everywhere, whether that's in the United States or in other countries. Um, and Britain has a long and rich history of being a centre of illicit finance. Uh, as I tell the story in my book, this 
dates back to the 1950s and is very much a post-imperial story after Britain stopped being able to rampage around the world, uh, essentially being the oligarch, doing what Putin is now doing to Ukraine, which very much used to be our business model, though we dressed it up as rather nicer than that. Um, we, we needed to find a new way of making a living. And um, what we found was in using our knowledge of how to build an empire to advise other people who wish to build empires in how to do so. Um, we moved from being the buy side to the sell side in the language of the financial markets. Um, this was done uh, initially in a very small scale way when a small group of bankers in 1955 realized the profits that were to be made by using not pounds uh, in the city of London. Uh, previously, pounds had been the, the, the currency of the British Empire and what was called the sterling system, which was had been the backbone of the globalized economy before the First World War. But they realized that if they did, they used not pounds, but dollars, then they were able to magically si uh, sidestep the rules and, and restrictions placed on the movement of money by both Great Britain and the United States. At the time, there were very onerous restrictions placed not just on the movement of money, but on the interest rates that could be charged on money. And the fact that they were able to provide, they were to gain this rules-free space to operate in in the city of London was extremely profitable. Uh, quite naturally, the secret of what they were doing didn't stay secret for very long. Other first British banks and then banks from continental Europe, Japan, the United States and elsewhere all moved in to take advantage of this hole in the global financial regulations. Um, uh, it is noticeable that the first dollars that were used to move through this uh, through this hole, the first dollars that in fact opened the hole, belonged to a bank from the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union's desire to evade American restrictions on the movement of money that essentially provided the seed capital for the rebirth of the city of London as a rules-free financial jurisdiction. And it's interesting, the banks needed a term, what you call this rules-free place where you could use dollars instead of pounds, and they borrowed a term from maritime law, what happens when you go out of reach of the jurisdiction of any government when there are no rules that is called offshore and that's what they called it this is where offshore finance came from essentially uh, the, the financial equivalent of being out at sea where there are no rules anything goes and there are pirates um, and it follows from this i mean this this essential business model that was a very simple example of how offshore came into being simply using dollars instead of pounds it is far more complicated now but essentially this business model of providing a, 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 an empty space where there are no rules, where anyone can operate, has been the development model for the, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Gibraltar, who all used respectively uh, shell companies or investment funds or money laundering and gambling as ways to earn money. Um, and, and Britain itself have all of them essentially provided an, a, a place where foreigners are able to avoid the rules imposed by their own countries. It follows from this that it is uh, a developmental imperative for Great Britain and the broader what's left of the British Empire that it is less regulated than other countries. If other countries are able to be less regulated than Britain, then the money will simply move there. And Britain has therefore engaged since the 1950s um, in essentially this race to the bottom. It is constantly be seeking to under-regulate other places. Um, however, this has become quite a skilled form of under-regulation in recent years because it is embarrassing to have uh, rules that allow people to do things that other countries don't do. It is the kind of thing that, that attracts comments in international gatherings, it attracts criticism from groups like the Financial Action Task Force. And so the way that Britain has ended up under-regulating its financial system has been quite subtle. I've been, become very interested by it recently, and I'm actually quite keen to try and come up with a term for it, so I don't think there is a term for this. And we've seen it this year, in fact, with the passage of the Economic Crime Act. The Economic Crime Act passed in the wake of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, imposes transparency on offshore owned property in London. Previously, oligarchs loved owning property in London behind uh, shell, company, uh, shell companies in tax havens to disguise their ownership. And it has been a long-standing demand of campaigners um, that the ownership of these shell companies be revealed. Um, so in the Economic Crime Act, uh, the, uh, that it is designed to create um, a register of the ownership of these shell companies. So we'll finally be able to see what oligarchs own, who owns what in, in London, this major market for kleptocratic wealth. However, there is no resources been made available for this law to be enforced. And this is something we've seen again and again. We have a new economic crime bill coming later in the year, which is designed to force Companies House, uh, Britain's own register of, of companies, which has been a major problem in providing shell companies for money laundering schemes, including 
that of Danske Bank, probably the biggest, if not possibly the second biggest money laundering scheme of all time, was largely enabled behind British registered shell structures. Um, this economic crime bill would supposedly regulate that situation. But again, no new resources are being made available for that to happen. So we end up with a sort of performative enforcement mechanisms being created by the British government that never actually amount to anything. We saw this um, uh, five years ago with the passage of the unexplained wealth order at the time heralded as a silver bullet to end kleptocracy and to end the oligarchs. But really, again, it didn't really amount to anything because no extra resources came with it when the National Crime Agency tried to use an unexplained wealth order against a, um, you know, a significant oligarch from the former Soviet Union, the daughter of the former president of Kazakhstan, Dariga Nazarbayeva, and her son, Nurali Aliyev, um, who owned substantial property in London. Um, they were able to retain uh, some extremely powerful and well-resourced London law firm who destroyed the National Crime Agency's argument. Um, in my book, I described the uh, mismatch in resources between the two sides as being like a match between Hereford FC and Real Madrid, which is a European uh, soccer uh, reference that may not cross the Atlantic, but perhaps it could be described as being a bit like watching me trying to play tennis against Rafael Nadal. Um, the defeat was total and embarrassing. And the other side's costs, which the National Crime Agency was left having to bear, £1.5 million was the entire budget they'd had for using unexplained wealth orders for an entire decade. Quite naturally, we haven't seen any being used against kleptocrats since then. Um, and this is essentially the situation that we have. Uh, the British government pretends to um, enforce economic um, crime laws, international economic crime norms. Uh, the actual laws look good. They are regularly assessed as being excellent by the Financial Action Task Force. But when the rubber hits the road, they don't really amount to anything. The enforcement is appalling. Um, and we've seen this again and again. There was this incredibly telling quote from the director of the National Crime Agency when she was giving evidence to a parliamentary intelligence and security committee a couple of years ago, when asked why she didn't do more or her officers didn't do more to take on the, the oligarchs, she replied that she was bluntly concerned about the impact on her budget. That was her words, which is a, a pretty shocking indictment. It's hard to imagine the head of the FBI saying that he would struggle to take, that, that he wouldn't want to take on an oligarch because he was concerned about the impact on his budget. And just last week, I was doing a talk at a book festival um, just near London, um, and uh, an employee of one of the major enforcement agencies came up to me afterwards to have a chat. Um, and I asked if there was anything that she thought I should be uh, writing about. She said, simply just write about how hard we're trying and how few resources we have and how few people we have. She was almost in tears. And that is the situation that we see here again and again. Um, now, this is primarily a British problem, but it's not only a British problem. We've seen uh, the European Union has also sanctioned a huge number of um, Russian oligarchs uh, following the invasion of Ukraine. And a very large number of them have um, challenged their designations in court. I did actually look up um, which oligarchs had challenged a designation in court. Um, the list, uh, as far as I can see, um, and, and they're only listed by surname. So I'm, I'm guessing that these people are all Russian oligarchs. Um, certainly most of them are, includes Pyotr Avin, uh, Roman Abramovich, Mikhail Friedman, and then Konov, Bereskin, Zubitsky, Pumpianski, Mashkovich, Mazepin, Pumpianska, Melichenko, Khan, Timchenko, Mordashov, Panmarenko, Usmanov, Nazieva, Ismailova, Prigozhina. That, I mean, it's a, it's a who's who of very wealthy Russians, owning tens of billions of pounds between them. The resources, the legal resources they'll be able to bring to bear to challenge the European Union will, I fear, swamp those of the European Union's legal action service. Um, and that is going to be the case for a very long time. Few uh, Western countries resource um, the battle against kleptocrats adequately. Even the United States, which has always been the gold standard of resourcing uh, the battle against financial crime, um, is struggling to provide the resources that the uh, IRS needs, as we heard just a couple of weeks ago from an undersecretary in the Treasury. Um, so, yeah, what it would be wonderful to see would be somehow to transform the race to the bottom uh, dynamic that Britain has always been part of to a race to the top. How do we somehow manage to encourage each other to do the right thing and provide more resources to our law enforcement agencies, to, to, to provide even better laws to, that can be enforced, to provide um, better frameworks within which the professional enablers uh, can operate so that accountants and lawyers don't see moving kleptocrats money as a pathway to great wealth, but instead would see it as a pathway to going to prison. That's the challenge in front of all of us, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, we will look forward to Q&A and discussion with you uh, after our 
uh, next speakers. Uh, we have uh, Representative Abigail Spanberger, who was not able to join us in person, but has provided some recorded remarks, which we'll now hear, uh, and then follow with uh, Kevin Hollenreich. Thanks. Thank you all for the invitation to join you virtually today. And thank you to everyone in attendance who works on combating the harmful impact of corrupt financial practices. As someone who previously worked money laundering cases and tracked transnational criminal organizations, I'm excited to join you all to highlight the importance of Western nations working together to combat dirty money in our respective countries. With Vladimir Putin's horrific war of aggression against Ukraine, there is heightened attention on how Western economies must do more to crack down on kleptocrats, oligarchs, and criminals using Western financial systems as safe havens for dirty money, including in the United States and the UK. That's why I'm encouraged by events like this one that promote cooperation and maybe even a little healthy competition between countries as we race to the top to prevent our economies from being a safe harbor for criminals. And the United States has a ways to go in making sure that our financial system is free of illicit funds. As you all know, the United States was just named the most secretive jurisdiction in the world by the 2022 Financial Secrecy Index. Many leaders here in Congress, career public servants at our federal agencies and civil society groups recognize the urgent need to stop Russian oligarchs, global kleptocrats, adversarial regimes, and worldwide criminals from pouring illicit funds into our banking systems and overall economy. In Congress, I am proud to be part of the Bipartisan Caucus Against Foreign Corruption and Kleptocracy, where I work with my colleagues across several different committees and backgrounds to develop common sense solutions to strengthen our financial systems against this plague of dirty money. I'm also proud that Congress passed and the President signed into law the Corporate Transparency Act in 2020 to effectively end the abuses of anonymous U.S. shell companies, and that's progress. But Congress must do more to closely monitor and support the successful implementation of this critical law and other anti-money laundering enforcement efforts. That's why I've consistently advocated for additional funding for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, so that they can have the resources they need to fulfill their recently expanded mission and meet the current moment. Earlier this year, I led a bipartisan group of 27 colleagues in the United States House to urge appropriators for this year's budget to include increased funding for FinCEN. We also highlighted FinCEN's crucial work to enforce compliance with US imposed sanctions on the Russian Federation, as well as individual Russian oligarchs and criminals. Last year, I sent a similar letter with a bipartisan group of colleagues and was encouraged that House and Senator appropriators substantially increased FinCEN's fiscal year 2022 funding and passed a supplemental spending package with additional funds for FinCEN. That was a small victory, and I'm looking forward to more victories moving forward. I'm proud to be one of the strongest advocates for FinCEN in this year's appropriations process. I also believe that Congress must pass legislation targeted at strengthening the US response to money laundering and financial crimes. I'm a proud original co-sponsor of the Enablers Act, a critically important bipartisan bill led by my colleagues like Tom Malinowski of New Jersey. This bill would take important steps towards blocking the quote unquote enablers of corruption by imposing stronger due diligence requirements on US based middlemen to live up to our values. It would require America to stop giving kleptocrats and criminals a safe haven for the money they steal from their own people. Thank you again for the opportunity to address you all today. I look forward to building even more support for the US federal response to money laundering. I appreciate your strong work, your partnership, and your advocacy in this endeavor. Thank you for having me today. We'll now turn to Kevin Hollenreich, who is a UK Member of Parliament and also the Chair of the All Parliamentary all party parliamentary group on fair business banking. Uh, Kevin has been spearheading uh, efforts to fight uh, economic crime in the UK and uh, that uh, all, part, uh, all party parliamentary group has been uh, developing an economic crimes manifesto. So we're interested in hearing more about that manifesto and the opportunities for reform. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks Ian. Um, I got into this particular area of policy because I kind of probably went down a rabbit hole, to be honest. I, I, I've been the co-chair of the All Party Group on Fair Business Banking uh, in Parliament probably for the best part of four years now. And um, 
there's so much abuse by the banking sector to businesses, particularly RBS and Lloyds. And um, the question that kept coming up, including ironically from the then uh, chief executive of the Financial Conduct Authority, our regulators of the financial services sector in the UK, was um, why haven't bankers who are guilty of this abuse of our businesses, which is so important to our economy, why haven't gone to jail? And uh, not just for the abuse itself, the fraud that was inflicted upon businesses, but actually the cover-up, a clear cover-up that happened afterwards. And I promise you, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all. And um, it was just the pure facts. And uh, uh, say, Andrew Bailey himself said, that people should have gone to jail. And it's quite ironic because he was probably the only person who could have sanctioned the people responsible for that kind of cover-up. But um, I kind of, so really lifting up rocks, looking underneath. And uh, one of the rocks I looked under um, was uh, the book written by Oliver called Moneyland. And I read it on holiday two or three years ago in the summer and um, and much to the annoyance of my wife, uh, was just appalled by what I, what I read in there as somebody, I think alongside Oliver, was, was quite an idealist or somebody who really does believe we should have a system that's fair and just. And, um, and that clearly I could see from that book and what Oliver articulates in that book is, is far from the case. And not just that this stuff happens in every country, it happens particularly in the UK in terms of the cleaning the money that then goes elsewhere. So um, I must say, having read the book and uh, was com- very moved by it, um, um, I saw it was a great opportunity, really. We, we have these tools at our disposal. If, if th- things are going wrong in the UK because of our lax controls, then the good news is, as parliamentarians, and I've been a member of parliament for seven years, is that we can then do something about it. Um, the frustration is that we hadn't done something about it before now, of course, but there's no time at the present. Um, and Oliver, Oliver's book, uh, Butler to the World, is a fantastic book again. And I think the number one thing for me is re- reading the book is you understand how this happened in the first place. G.K. Chesterton once said that um, don't remove a fence until you understand why it was put there in the first place. And I think that's what Oliver does articulate. He articulates why the fences were there in the first place, or indeed, more accurately, why they were not there in the first place. And the fences haven't put, been put there in terms of stopping this stuff happening because it's pretty good for the UK economy. Um, there's a great quote in the book which says, you know, um, um, you can't expect people to be virtuous when the temptation becomes too great. And that was one of the people... I think in the enforcement sector. So, um, and that's why we have this holy, unholy alliance between our lax re- regulations in the UK and uh, the ease of setting up a company and how you can make that so obscure. Um, the fact that we've got this pretty much zero regulation of offshore, um, offshore financial transactions, which led to the euro dollar. I love the quote within the book, which <laughs> one guy who's looking into this said, quite accurately even the experts don't know what this is all about really and this is what happens it creates a kind of life of its own it, it, it uh, uh, forms life of its own and then um, so offshore lax regulation the huge expertise and the concentration of expertise we have in the city of london be it uh, financial experts or our legal experts and and tax experts who all conspire effectively um to provide the mechanisms to to salt away this money and then the key other thing that happens that the UK can facilitate are our tax havens, our overseas territories that uh, have very low tax uh, rates or from zero tax rates. So one thing you don't want to happen to your money if you're going to launder it, that's cost you a bit of money, um, you don't want to pay tax on it. So routing them through a tax haven where there's no tax is, is a perfect solution for people who've been stealing this money. And um, some great examples in the book. I, mean, I love the one about I hated the one about Tanzania, how we sold the radar system to Tanzania that was pretty poor country that wants to improve its its uh, economy through tourism. So installed an expensive radar system that cost $40 million. And as Oliver sets out in the book, um, $12 million was salted away in backhanders, really. And it was done, and that was done through UK uh, UK channels and then through the British Virgin Islands. So that unholy alliance showing how this money is um, is then uh, profit can be made of this money by people who shouldn't profit from it. And um, so um, 
we're in a great position actually in terms of for the first time dealing with this and um i think oliver in his prelude mentioned um lord agnew resigning that was only i think the 25th of january lord agnew who was then uh, responsible for tackling uh, fraud across uh, across government he resigned and one of the things he said in his resignation he said we're dropping the economic crime bill and um, that we planned for this parliament so um so it shows how far we've moved in that we we actually didn't drop that bill in the end and sadly the reason we didn't was because of ukraine and the horrendous horrific invasion of ukraine and we suddenly realized actually how pernicious this stuff is and um so this has suddenly come into public consciousness when that was when that was announced when lord Agu, uh, resigned myself and the then anti-corruption champion john penrose went straight to the leader of the house jacob b smog who was then leader of the house and said why on earth is this being dropped this is really important and the answer we got back was well you want to do it but it's just not kind of sexy right now this kind of stuff it just in the public don't quite get it well they get it now they really get it now and this is because of putin and eventually putin will suffer from this because it's become t- uh, now clearly clearly obvious to people that every tyrant every terrorist every trafficker whether it be drugs or people on this planet really needs to be able to salt their money away through these channels if they couldn't move their money from their jurisdictions. If you couldn't move your money out of Russia, there'd be little point in profiting from the Russian people or from Russian assets uh, that you effectively steal from the states, from the people. Um, so we facilitate that. Uh, and so now we're gonna do something about it. We've started to do something about it. We're not doing enough, but we are starting. Well, first the economic crime bill has now been passed the legislation. Um, we've got another one on the way. Um, the government is acting uh, more urgently on this now, um, but we want them to go much further. And that's why Margaret Hodge and I, uh, very uh, is a cross party, Margaret's from the other side of the house in, in politics, but we work very closely on this and very collaboratively. And many other parliamentarians are championing this, uh, or persuade, trying to persuade the government to go much further, more quickly. We've, we've put together this manifesto, which has many things in it, which I won't list right now, but. A couple of things I'll pick out that I think are really important. Um, so uh, I think Oliver earlier mentioned um, Dansky Bank. There's 200 billion pounds money laundering to Dansky Bank. Nobody yet, has, the company hasn't been fined. Um, but uh, what will probably happen is Dansky Bank will be fined. Um, HSBC was fined 1.9 trillion, sorry, billion dollars for um, money laundering of for the Mexican drug cartels. And NatWest was fined this year 245 million quid for money laundering in the UK, for allowing money laundering in the UK, turning a blind eye. As long as, as fi- fines will always be seen as a cost of doing business, as long as that is the case, the people who run the banks will, not, will just tolerate this, will turn a blind eye to it, because the fines are paid way after the, they've usually left their posts in the, in the bank. So we need to... We need a law that says if you turn a blind eye to this stuff, if you don't put the measures in place to stop it, a failure to prevent offence, the, the company could get fined, so the bank could get fined, or the uh, tax, tax advisors could get fined or wherever else. But if you, you personally, you will be personally liable for that, and you could go to jail personally. When we did this in the construction sector, Health and Safety at Work Act in 1974, we made directors personally liable for not preventing accidents at work. Fatalities on construction sites dropped by 90% the following year. This is what we need. We also need whistleblower rules in the UK to uh, protect and to compensate whistleblowers who are key to this because all the evidence only ever comes out through whistleblowers. And we need uh, to hit those enablers, as I said earlier, enablers are key to this too. Um, but the other thing we need, obviously you need to do is beef up resources. As Oliver said, you know, there's just this massive inequality of arms. What I, we would like to see, our, our legal system in the UK is different from the US, is, is that our, if you take forward a, a prosecution, you stand, uh, the, the risk, you take the risk of adverse costs, the other side costs if you lose. Uh, other than for vexations, prosecutions, I think we should abandon that. There should be no adverse costs for our law enforcement agencies if they take a, a 
case for this is not vexatious. We do this already in employment law. There is no reason we couldn't expand this, I believe, into this particular area to stop those kleptocrats, those tyrants from, from getting this stuff into court. We've got all the tools at our disposal. We need to beef up our laws, beef, beef up our enforcement. If we do, we'll end up with a cleaner system and a better world. And I absolutely play a huge uh, uh, can't compliment Oliver enough for what the work he does and many other people in this space. It's work that he does and many other people that bring the, this stuff to the attention of parliamentarians like me. And only then can we start to act on this. So thank you, Oliver. Please read Oliver's books. Please contribute to his campaign. Thank you so much, Kevin. And I'm really glad that you took money land on your holiday. It, it seems to have a transformative impact. I hope you can stay with us and uh, entertain some questions. We're going to turn to Sue Hawley, who's the executive director of Spotlight on Corruption in the UK to add some remarks on what she hopes uh, will happen this year and what the reform opportunities look like. Sue. Great, thank you very, very much. And thank you for inviting me and, and to pay tribute, not just to Oliver, but also to Kevin, because the, the cross party work that he and Margaret have done in the UK parliament has been absolutely fundamental to shifting the political calculus in the UK. And for the government to know that there's like such a strong advocate from their own side, pushing them all the time, it's been incredibly useful. Um, and I think, you know, it is a matter of political will, as Kevin just said, I mean, we've seen, you know, to go from a situation where we've been waiting three or four years for stuff, for a bill to be passed in one week, which is what happened with the Economic Crime Act, to see a situation where now the UK government is actively putting forward proposals to top, stop kleptocrats bringing strategic lawsuits against journalists and civil society for um, airing allegations. You know, it, it, it is a, a really changed environment. Um, I mean, another you know key important thing coming up is that it looks like the new economic crime plan that the government is developing might, for the first time, actually commit the government publicly to strengthening the UK's resilience to transnational kleptocracy, and that would be the first time that there's a kind of official government commitment uh, to tackle kleptocracy, and I, I think a lot of that's come from the US's uh, anti-corruption strategy leading the way and sending some really good signals for our government to follow. Um, both uh, Kevin and Oliver have mentioned the new economic crime bill. The key part of that is um, companies house reform. If anyone who knows the UK system, this is the absolute um, kind of the, the biggest loophole <laughs> in our system, which has allowed um, pretty much every laundromat scandal has had UK companies or corporate structures at their heart. Um, and I think what we're seeing there is a really positive shift from the private sector, like the, the, the banking lobby saying, look, the government has to do even better than what it's proposing. Um, and they need to make sure that their proposals don't just help this body spot crime once it's done, but actually prevent crime. Uh, a big area everyone's mentioned resourcing uh, is how do we go from uh, you know giving companies house uh, you know really very little enforcement power to having the resources to be able to check the information that's coming in and I think a key thing that Kevin didn't mention is a big proposal in their manifesto that we've got to move from a system which is so cheap it's just 12 pounds to set up a UK company um, if we could just make it 50 or 100 pounds of resources that would come in to actually mean that this data could be verified would be huge. Uh, so I think the other really big uh, issue is around um, professional enablers. Uh, you know, there has been quite a lot of talk in government for quite a long time about professional enablers. We have a crazy, crazy system of 25 different anti-money laundering regulators, all with different standards lawyers and accountants are effectively self-regulating and there's meant to be a big government announcement this week as to what it's going to do it's on a big review of what the uk money laundering supervisory landscape should look like we don't know what we that's going to look like they're holding their cards very close to their chest but 
across civil society, we really want consolidation and standardization. It shouldn't be the fact that the gambling industry actually regulates really well in the UK and the legal sector is appallingly poor. You know, you can have like a fine of nearly 250 million on banks and the highest fine for lawyers is 25,000. Um, the other you know, positive development on the horizon is the new anti-corruption strategy, uh, which is due in early 2024. Um, and just to say, I think the sanctions landscape, um, you know, there's a really uh, an opportunity here, uh, if we can take it, to take that interest in Russia, to make sure that all the money that has been put into enforcing sanctions and building relationships between countries is actually kept in place to go on tackling kleptocracy, not just from Russia, but across the world. Um, I think I won't, I'll, I'll wrap up now because I know we're running out of time, but just to say on a, a slightly more depressing note, you know, these are all very positive things, but we are also facing some real headwinds. And I think two of those are you know, massive cuts in government spending coming to the UK. We know law enforcement agencies have all been told to look at how they would cut their budgets by 20 to 40%. Um, and there's going to be some really hard choices there about how you know, enforcement keeps money for this kind of activity. And the other is, you know, to go back to what Oliver started with, is the deregulatory agenda. Um, there is a big push to make the city uh, of London again as you know, competitive and deregulated as possible. And uh, the risk is that we get rid of the Russian money but we create new gaps through which new kleptocratic resources can flood into our economy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. And uh, last but not least, we'll turn to the FACT Coalition's Government Affairs Director, Erica Hanachak, to uh, give us some remarks about the reform agenda and opportunities this year in the US. And please, uh, please get your questions ready as we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Thanks, Ian, and thanks to our panelists for their comments and to our partners across the Atlantic for their efforts. Um, I'll add a little bit more on the opportunity here in the US uh, to advance financial transparency reforms. It really is the biggest opportunity in nearly 20 years. As Oliver mentioned, human rights abusers, criminals, and adversaries exploit offshore financial systems that are not offshore at all, but are nurtured in Western rule of law jurisdictions, including our own backyard in the United States. The UK may be the butler to the world, but the US has its own financial uh, and illicit services role to play, uh, slinging cowboy cocktails and other convoluted legal entity arrangements that make it the world's largest provider of financial secrecy as of 2022. Treasury officials estimate that illicit flows equaling 2% of US GDP make it through the US system every year. In light of this new unsavory uh, distinction, Congress and the administration have unprecedented unity of purpose and interest in mitigating the US role as a destination for the world's illicit funds. So there are three areas I'll discuss in which the US has made commitments and in some places even progress to counter illicit finance and to keep up with its international allies. This includes first, requiring most US entities to declare their true beneficial owner uh, to the US government as demanded by the recently passed Bipartisan Corporate Transparency Act. Second, mandating that gatekeepers to the US financial system, uh, enablers like real estate agents, private investment advisors, lawyers, accountants, and corporate and trust service providers know their customers before and while doing business. And third, better resourcing our nation's financial crime fighters at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN. So let's first talk about beneficial ownership transparency. As noted earlier, the US is finally moving to join the ranks of its international allies like the UK um, in 2021, passing the Bipartisan Corporate Transparency Act. The act requires US LLCs, corporations, certain trusts, and other similar entities to name their true owner to a database housed at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. After 10 years of debate, this law passed with one of the widest coalitions of support seen lately in Washington. As part of its inaugural strategy on countering corruption announced in December, the administration has prioritized three subsequent rulemakings to get the CTA online, but have phased delays in implementing this legislation. Under the statute, rules implementing the CTA were supposed to be promulgated by January 1st of this year. No rule of the three yet is yet finalized. 
In order to be a credible, credible host for December's International Anti-Corruption Conference, which Washington will be hosting this December, um, the U.S. must finalize all rules for the CTA by the end of the year. This would demonstrate to the world that the U.S. is truly committed to tackling corruption. Now, unlike the database in the UK of beneficial ownership information, the US database by law will not be public. That's why defining who can access the database and when is so important. As FinCEN works right now on the federal rulemaking defining CTA database access, it must ensure that authorized users have timely, uncomplicated and complete access to the database in a manner consistent with the statute. Crucially, the CTA also allows not just US law enforcement, but international law enforcement and national security officials to get information from the database using certain protocols. Pretty critical at a time that the international community has levied the most uh, multilateral of sanctions regimes in recent memory. As part of the rulemaking, FinCEN should define access protocols in a way that facilitates international cooperation, including in sanctions and human rights cases. Next, the administration has pledged to tackle blind spots in the US anti-money laundering regime, for instance, in the $50 trillion uh, real estate and the $11 trillion private investment markets. These blind spots enable the criminal and corrupt to move their money through the US. Um, the move by the administration reverse, reverses approximately 20 years of so-called temporary exemptions on corners of these sectors that have basically absolved them from performing AML due diligence or otherwise knowing their customer before and after, before and while doing business. This is one of the areas in which the UK may run some circles around the US in terms of their law, um, though I think we all agree enforcement is pretty critical. Um, I'll mention um, two areas briefly uh, in which the administration already has authorities around real estate and private investment. Um, in the real estate uh, in market, uh, it's pretty apparent that the U.S. real estate market is a magnet for journey money, according to Global Financial Integrity, drawing at least $2.3 billion in known money laundering in the past five years. Um, the administration has already initiated a federal rulemaking process to require some due diligence obligations for U.S. real estate professionals but it must take care to ensure that that rule encompasses the full scope of risky transactions within that market. This means instituting a permanent nationwide rule that covers both commercial and residential real estate transactions, whether they be non-financed or indirectly transferred through the ownership of an entity. A reporting regime, <clears throat> excuse me, should also contemplate instituting cascading reporting obligations that apply to multiple real estate professionals to ensure full coverage. Further for private investment, Cases like the Russian oligarch and Putin ally Roman Abramovich, who parked $1.3 billion in U.S. hedge funds, demonstrate the risk that the U.S. private investment sector poses for money laundering. The administration has pledged to revive a 2015 effort to bring registered investment advisors, working with hedge funds, private equity, venture capital firms, under the U.S. AML framework. In light of the national security and market implications brought to light by the invasion of Ukraine, the administration must not delay in bringing forward a rule that would bring these investment advisors and the unregistered investment companies they work with under the purview of USAML framework. Lastly, as Rep Spanberger mentioned, there is one area in which, the, in which the administration needs additional authorities from Congress, and that's to bring, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, um, designated non-financial business uh, professionals under the purview of the USAML system. So think lawyers or trust service providers. I'm happy to talk more about in Q&A about where this stands in Congress, but legislators should pass these reforms into law by the end of this year. Finally, as people have said time and time again, it all comes down to resourcing. Um, none of this can happen without Congress appropriating funds for FinCEN to get the job done. Unfortunately, FinCEN is chronically underfunded, understaffed, and relegated decades back in the technology it's using to fight 21st century threats. In recognition of the critical sanctions role that FinCEN plays, Congress has increased FinCEN's budget by $80 million in the past six months. And it has approved an additional, or it has suggested that it will move forward to approve $210 million in additional funding for fiscal year 2023, but that's not yet confirmed. Um, but let's just think about it for a minute. To counter illicit financial flows totaling 2% of US GDP, um, a recent report by Transparency International has found that the US spends just 0.0006% of its GDP toward fighting financial crime. So we really do need to move forward on the resourcing bit. So why don't I stop there and I'm looking forward to your questions. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Erica, and to all of our, our panelists today. 
Uh, we have we do have some time for questions, and we have some questions coming in. Um, if you do have a question, um, please do send it in. Uh, the first question is for Oliver. Uh, somebody's planning uh, their holiday, and they they want to know if you're going to bring back the London kleptocracy tours uh, because they have that on their bucket list. Yeah. Um, I we have made a. a a slow start to returning re resuming the tours they were quite regular before covid um but obviously covid made it unpopular for people to pack onto a bus even if they were looking at something as thrilling as oligarch owned property um we did we have done one for mps this year but the challenge is that since uh covid the three kind of organizers uh, roman whose idea they were now lives in luxembourg arthur lives in italy and i live in wales so it's even harder uh, to organize them than it was before. It's always been a bit like herding cats, but now it's a bit like herding cats that live in, you know, three different countries. So um, so it, it's a challenge. But yeah, we, 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 we do have an ambition of getting people back in the bus. It's just um, it always takes a little while to get these things going. And for those who, those people who don't know what the tours are like, so what did you do on those tours? Well, I mean, it, the model is a Hollywood tour. Um, you know, when you drive around Hollywood Hills looking at houses that belong to mansions that belong to film stars, except we drive around mainly West London if the traffic is is light enough up to North London, uh, just pointing out properties that belong to uh, oligarchs and telling the story of the money that bought the properties. Uh, you know, we tend to focus on ex-Soviet properties simply because we're kind of mostly Russianists. But, um, but you know, if we're lucky enough to have a tour guide uh, with expertise in the Middle East or Sub-Saharan Africa or or Malaysia or elsewhere, then then you know London is a target-rich environment. We're not just butler to the Russians; we're very much butler to the world. So um, we we have all sorts uh, available, um, and um, and you know we're only limited by the atmosphere by by the by the appetite of our guests of how many houses they want to look at. Um, you know we could keep going forever. Um, we have another question about, um, you know, a number of panelists, including Oliver, have talked about um, how these issues of dirty money are not victimless crimes. There are a lot of victims uh, of these crimes. Um, and the question is whether uh, the UK and US have had successful examples of returning forfeited dirty money uh, to countries victimized by kleptocrats. Are there any good experiences that that any of our participants would like to note? Um. <laughs> Happy to take that one in if you want. I mean, the yeah. UK zero is the answer. Um, it's very difficult, you know, um, you've got to, be able to, well, you say we've, we've frozen assets, clearly that's easier to do than sequestering assets, take it off and, and, and put and, and distributing it elsewhere because you've got to identify that money was that there's a proceeds of crime for that particular, uh, that those monies and, and property rights are really important and fundamental part of our economy. We can't just go in and start taking assets off people unless you can prove they're a proceed of a crime. So, um, and clearly lots of crimes were undertaken in different jurisdictions rather than ours it's difficult we are looking at it we'd love to be able to do that it's one of the things we talk about a lot in parliament really keen to hear from different people on ideas how we do that we've got some ideas but we need to kind of fully form those ideas before we we kind of put them out there i think can i quickly add that, yeah i mean to give you an example of how slow it is uh, many of you will remember uh, uh, the nigerian uh, dictator of Atcha. The UK has just recently sent back its um, first amount of money that went through the UK financial system, uh, and that's you know some twenty years you know afterwards, uh, just to show you how how slow it is. So I, I think it's, you know working with uh, legislators to work out how one could make sure it happens more effectively, uh, but you know keeping within the rule of law. Um, and making sure it goes back in a way that actually helps prevent corruption uh, going forward is um, really key. Thanks. There was the case in the UK where they prosecuted um, uh, the son of President Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, or, or certainly 
um, it confiscated some of his assets. And then you have the challenge of what do you do with them having confiscated them? Um, because if you send them back to Ecuador or Guinea, you're basically just giving them straight back to him, um, which is a more or less completely pointless activity. So it is, it is a incredibly fraught, as Kevin was saying, difficult, um, difficult business. And I mean, there have been more or less successful examples uh, in the UK or US, but Switzerland returning some money to Kazakhstan was done quite well via some civil society organizations, but it's very difficult to do that at, a, at, a, at a, the kind of scale that we're talking about. That only really works at a relatively small scale. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Awesome, thank you. Um, I completely agree with my colleagues in terms of the importance of understanding who owns an asset and to being able to prove that you know chain of ownership in order to be able to seize those assets. We've seen that in conversations with the Department of Justice, Justice's asset forfeiture team, um, particularly in relating back to the, uh, the importance of beneficial ownership. But we do see in terms of the United States, you know, um, Oliver mentioned Obiang, um, how some of the money that kleptocrats move into the US is tied up in assets that are really hard to repatriate. So for instance, um, you know, mansion, California mansions, real estate um, that make it really challenging. And so from that perspective, um, you know, moving forward, some of the reforms that we just discussed for the US would be key. And then also looking at legislative initiatives like the Justice for Victims of Kleptocracy Act, which is a feature of this Klepto Month um, put forward by the caucus in Congress that would list those assets publicly um, and uh, expresses, you know, Congress's intent that these assets should be returned back to the people that they were, um, you know, taken away from um, from these countries. So um, initiatives like that just make it easier to hold accountable um, US asset forfeiture program. Great, thanks, Erica. Um, the next question I have is uh, it's from Paul Massaro, who has uh, um, been instrumental in pushing some of these issues in Congress, uh, works with the US Health Sinki Commission. Uh, he, he says, for us, the post-invasion world has been eye-opening. It seems the UK has at least been with the program and is viewed very positively in Ukraine, while other allies have been pushing for a return to business as usual with Russia. How should we interpret this? Any take it's, it's a very interesting question, very good to, to hear from Paul. Um, hi, Paul. Um, I, I mean, the UK has for a long time had a kind of strong rule foreign policy in that it has been simultaneously a leading right in NATO and other coalitions, um, uh, Western coalitions while also providing uh, service uh, enthusiastically to all the enemies of those Western coalitions and has somehow managed to maintain this contradiction uh, for, for decades without anyone really noticing or, or talking about it very much. Uh, so yeah, the UK has been very generous uh, to, the, to, to the Ukrainian armed forces with, with weaponry and, and support uh, as, as generous as the US, but certainly more generous than, than anyone else. Um, you know that there that that has not been something we've seen so much of from other European countries, but they've been generous in other ways, particularly with regard to helping um, house much much larger numbers of refugees. So I'm not sure anyone has been you know perfectly uh, behaved in in any of this. Um, you know, and I certainly don't think the the the, the real the real uh, contribution the UK could make is by totally cutting financial system to to kleptocrats in the long term. And that's something that we haven't seen happening just yet. Great, thanks. Um, well, I think uh, we'll wrap up with one final question. I think I'll send this to Erica and Sue. Um, the question relates to beneficial ownership data. And obviously the UK has um, a public uh, beneficial ownership registry, but there've been significant problems with the, the quality of the, the data and verification. Um, in the US, we're just setting up our beneficial ownership database. Um, so what, uh, for Sue, what, you know, what hopes do you have in terms of reforms so that the, the information that's publicly available is, is accurate and verified? And what steps do you see as being needed? And for Erica, um, the question also uh, asked what role could AI, blockchain, distributed ledgers play in improving accuracy by triangulating from other data sources, uh, governmental or corporate. But I think the broader issue is, you know, what steps should the government take to verify the ownership information? So maybe Sue, go first. This is absolutely key. And this is going to relate to what I was referring to earlier about the UK banking industry actually saying 
we need the proposals on the table to be even stronger. Um, and that if we could bring in more resources that could use uh, you know, data analytics, but we also need, you know, the company has to have power to cross check information with regulators, be able to share information uh, with the private sector. So I think you're, it's always a proof is in the pudding. And as we know, you know, the current UK register has been, you know, publicly awful. <laughs> I think like all of us got some of the best stories about, you know, the kind of people that have, have registered with, you know, crazy names and, you know, with no real economic activity and uh, Adolf Hitler, I think, is one of the kind of companies that was set up. So I, I think it is, um, you know, this is an opportunity and it will be down to people like Kevin and other legislators really pushing the government hard when the bill goes through uh, Parliament to make it as, as, as really powerful as possible. Thanks, Sue. Um, I couldn't uh, agree with that more about how necessary it is and some key lessons that we can learn from the UK experience, uh, particularly in the US. Um, the Corporate Transparency has a legal uh, act makes it um, legally mandated that the beneficial ownership database be highly useful to law enforcement and verification is such a key component of making that work. Um, we do see our experience, uh, the experience of our European counterparts that do have databases that there is a consideration under AMLD6 right now um, to, to include a verification as part of um, a broader um, package of anti-money laundering reforms to make those databases also useful. The US uh, system should include that at the get-go. Um, and I think you know there, there are two key components here. First is to make sure that information can be verified in real time as it's entered into the database. This both minimizes the chances that law enforcement or you know, database operators have to go back to, uh, to businesses uh, to, to make sure, hey, did you, did you mean to put this? Is this misspelled? Um, you know, Mickey Mouse probably isn't the owner of this entity, so how can we make sure that this is a real person at the other end of the line? Um, but then uh, also to, to make sure that that information is useful. The second component where the US database isn't public, but the UK system is. Um, the UK, we've seen that it being public has actually been very helpful in, in improving some of the quality components um, because there's some auditing that can be done by civil society and, and the utility and the, uh, the accuracy of that information. The US will not be able to have that experience, but um, alternatively, there are mandated audits that will be conducted by the Government Accountability Office um, to make sure that this information is highly useful for law enforcement and to, to check for accuracy and all that. So the GAO should be able to, empower, to be empowered to be able to conduct those audits in a meaningful way. Um, so couldn't agree more that this is something that the US de desperately needs to consider as it, set up, it sets up its own database. Thanks, Erica. Uh, Kevin or Oliver, any last words you'd like to share before we close? <clears throat> uh, I'm happy to. I'll leave Oliver to have the last word, but just a couple of points on the questions. So, I mean, I think in terms of, the, of Ukraine, I think where we've gone wrong is we've been too soft for too long with Putin. We should have acted more quickly, invasion of Crimea, we should, the sanctions have been at that point. We've pursued too many nations that have pursued a policy of appeasement. Germany, obviously, happy to by its gas and oil and, and France other, by other measures. So we should have acted more quickly sooner and we've got to carry through what we're doing right now internationally. Um, in terms of uh, databases, the key thing is transparency. There's no good having these databases if the people haven't got access to them. Because you know if you have a data dump, we've seen with suspicious activity reports that they're, they're pointless if it's simply a data dump because nobody has the time to go through it. What you need is AI could be very, very useful in, in, in joining the dots, but also the public, the press, parliamentarians, NGOs, wherever, the access to the databases, it needs to be verified data uh, and verified ownership details. And, and then we need to be able to look into this stuff and find out the information we need to be able to act upon it. It's, it's pointless in its raw form. It needs to be more intelligent than that. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think we, we, we for, two, for a very long time, we've been focusing on the very short term profits that can be made from moving kleptocrats money without really asking what it is we're selling. Um, well, you know, what exactly are, is the long term harm caused uh, to other, other countries, the countries sort of tyrannized by kleptocrats, but also to our own um, democratic systems. And uh, just as a final point, um, Sue mentioned that Adolf Hitler was a, a um, could be found on the UK corporate registry. That's true. It's actually Adolf 
Tooth Fairy Hitler. Those are his middle names, Tooth Fairy. Um, it's a company called Spy Priest Limited. You can look it up. It's apparently owned by a person called Lord Truman Michael Spy Priest. I'm guessing he's fictional too. Um, it, yeah, but however you do the beneficial ownership registry in the US, please don't do it like we do it. Sobering words to end on. Um, I really want to thank Oliver for, for writing this book and for drawing attention to these um, important issues. Um, you should go out and buy your copy of the book and like Kevin, uh, take it on your uh, summer vacation. And um, really appreciate the participation of Erica, uh, Sue and Kevin uh, in this panel and apologies to those questions we didn't get to in the, the short time we had together. Um, so thank you so much, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.